Hello. Welcome back, everybody. Folks, my first guest tonight is an Academy Award-winning actor you know from Gladiator, Noah, and Boy Erased. He now stars in The Loudest Voice. One question. Who is your audience? Everyone. We want to reach the widest audience possible. Well, I think that's wrong. Excuse me? We don't need everyone. Your problem is that you're talking broadcast. Cable is different. Cable is about one thing, niche. The loyalty of a passionate few. We need to program directly to the viewer who is predisposed to buying what we're trying to sell. In politics, it's called turning out the base. If we can do that, then they will never change the channel. Please welcome Russell Crowe. <laughs> What a very happy crowd of people you very have here tonight, happy crowd. They're happy to see you, Must have you, been Russell remarkably Crump. funny this uh, earlier on. No, no, it's all you. Oh. It's all you. Look they... at that bright, shining face of Steve. I Your know. comedy must have been superb. The, 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 the comedy was superb, but now Santa's here. What did he bring <laughs> in his sack? Well, now, what have I got for you this year, children? Exactly. The loudest voice. Now, we just saw a clip from The Loudest Voice, and I've uh, only seen the first episode so far. It's, uh, you're, you're playing Roger Ailes for the people who, out there who don't know, and, and it's about the founding and the development and the eventual, uh, of Fox News and the eventual fall of Ailes. Mm -hmm. and, and for those of you who did not recognize you in that clip, and I would understand why they did not recognize you in that, because you, you'll be glad to hear, are virtually unrecognizable as Roger Ailes right there. And it's a, it's a, it's a brilliant performance um, from you. what I've seen so far. Who knows what the other episodes yeah, yeah. are like. <laughs> But you, right now, it's yours to lose. The yeah. first one was fantastic. How long did it take you to get in this outfit every day? Well, when we first started, um, the prosthetic process was six hours. But then over time, we got it down less than that. We did two eps before Christmas and then five eps after. And the episodes after Christmas, we refined it and refined it. The quickest we did it one day was two hours and 17 minutes, but we got very lucky that day. It, it, does it get hot and kind of funky inside those suits? Terrible, man, because I've got two ball caps on. Um, the only part of me that you can see is a little bit of my forehead, my eyes, and my mouth. The rest is all prosthetics, and it's a full neck piece, and it wraps around. So what tends to happen, of course, you, you know, and we're doing a lot of scenes in very small offices mm -hmm. with 40, 50 crew members right there with you, mm -hmm. you know? So it tends to be very hot. And what ha happens with that makeup is when you sweat, sooner or later, as water has its will and way, it just starts to spurt out of you. <laughs> like, you know, you'd be sitting having a conversation and, and, and you can see in the eyes of the person you're talking to, something dramatic just happened. <laughs> well, in your, in your own research about him, it was anything that you learned that surprised you about Ailes? Yeah, there was, because we, we, you kind of tend to see him only in the context of the Fox News. And mm -hmm. if you know anything more about him, you possibly know that he was an advisor to three presidents. Right. The Nixon campaign, Reagan, and then Bush Sr. Mm -hmm. But he began, like in high school and college, he loved the theater. And oh, really? he played piano, and he loved a show tune, you know? And at 26... Like musicals? Yeah, like musicals. At 26, he was the executive producer of the Mike Douglas show. That's a hell of a powerful position at a very young age. And after he'd done the Nixon campaign, and actually this is a very interesting thing, in 1968 he gave a quote to a guy called Joe McGuinness from a book called The Selling of the President. And Roger Rail said in 1968, in the future, political parties will become television networks. Wow. That's an incredibly, uh, you know, uh, f deep thing to have said at a time when all of us were still just getting used to the idea of television. He could see that far ahead. But yeah, and for 10 years in, in the 70s leading up to Reagan, he tried to be a Broadway producer. And he had a minor hit with a, a show called Hot L Baltimore. Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah. So um, 
a lot of the things that you learn about Roger, you have to take with a grain of salt because he's a very theatrical man, yeah. you know? And uh, he would see things from, from that type of perspective, what will make people, you know, the same way as you put a Broadway show together, you know? How's the first number going to go? What are you going to hit them for before the, you, you break? You know? Well, that's a lot of what he's putting together in the mm. episode that I saw of him putting into the Fox News. It's a right. little less about what is the news here and what will look good on television. What, what works. What, what will make people turn it on. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. Truth be damned. Yeah. Well, not truth be damned necessarily, but truth has its place. <laughs> you truth know, is not I mean, in the, if you in watch, the If you position. watch that network, the 7 o'clock bulletin with Shep Smith is just the news. You know, the rest of the time it's opinion, even though it's called Fox News. Oh, I mean, I, I, I would grant that that. I mean, I, I think Shep does a fine job. I think Brett Baird does a fine job. Um, uh, Chris Wallace does a fine job on, on the Sundays over on Fox. But, I mean, when he was putting it together, one of the things that's sort of shocking the other people, the other characters he's talking to in, 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 the, in the first episode, is his willingness to make it look good, make it sound good, to, to make it something that people will turn on regardless of what the message necessarily is, because some people have their back up against his willingness to turn it into entertainment. Yeah, well, what he sa was saying, though, is that, you know, people don't really want to be informed. They don't want all of the details. They just want to feel informed. They want to think at some point in time in, the, in their mind that they've got that covered, you know? So he I was see. playing into that. But also, you've got to know that, you know, Roger, many, many times over the years, said if he hadn't have had seen a certain bias in media, then Fox News could have been the exact opposite because he was looking for the open area of the market. Mm -hmm. And it was in his estimation that CNN, that MSNBC, CNBC, um, you know, C-SPAN, ABC, NBC, CBS, The Times, The Post, everybody had a, a left-leaning bent. Mm -hmm. So to him, what was available was a conservative audience that was being underserved. And that proved to be very true because now you have one single news network which dominates half of the available audience. Right. So... It was purely a marketing He idea. won. Well, he's put uh, Fox News into an incredible situation, hasn't he? I mean, that, that is a money-making machine. They make $2 billion a year profit. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a, a hell of a thing when you think that news services began with the understanding that you would often use as part of your broadcast, but you did it from a perspective of not needing or requiring a profit. You know, the first network news and everything were, were seen as a public service. And quite frankly, I don't know how we got away from that. Well, we have to take a little bit of a break. Please don't go anywhere, because we're going to be right back with more Russell Crowe. The loudest voice.